the Everything But Politics podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 47 of the Everything But Politics podcast. Today we have an absolute legend on the podcast, rock and roll photographer, Mr. Jay Blakesburg, joining the show. Jay, thank you for joining us, man. Sure. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, boys. And yeah, happy to have you. And uh, I guess, Jay, uh, uh, some of our listeners may not know who you are. Can you give them a brief description of who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I live in San Francisco, and I guess I'm mostly known as a still photographer, although I've done a lot of um, video directing, um, things of that nature. Um, I also uh, have a small independent book publishing company, and I uh, mostly self-publish my own coffee table books. I've done, I think, something like 16 coffee table books. Uh, my most recent one is called Retro Blakesburg, and that came out, uh, God, I don't know, is it a year and a half ago now, something like that? And uh, it's sort of a career retrospective, and it's only photographs that I shot on film. And it was uh, curated and, and produced by my daughter, Ricky, who is 27 years old, and, and uh, Retro Blakesburg was her idea. Uh, during the pandemic, um, she came up with an idea to do a, po an, a podcast, an Instagram page, uh, based only on my photographs that I shot on film, and that's called Retro Blakesburg. And then the book came out of that, and then the museum exhibit came out of that. Right on. When were you first inspired to be a photographer? I know. Well, I mean, you know, inspiration comes at all times. I'd like to believe that I was inspired at some crazy early age, but... Um, I think I became inspired to become a photographer when I started looking and noticing photographs taken by other photographers, probably when I was a teenager in the 70s, you know, growing up in suburban New Jersey and uh, looking at albums like Live Dead and you open it up and there's these incredible photographs, which happened to be taken by a guy named Jim Marshall, or you would open up Relics Magazine and see pictures taken by Herb Green or Baron Woolman or um uh you know david gar uh any number of you know renowned photographers from the 60s and the 70s and so i started looking at those photos and was interested and then i started borrowing my dad's camera my my stepbrother's camera and taking pictures of my friends being all fucked up on drugs and alcohol and you know stumbling about people's houses you know everybody was fodder for my camera and um and, you know, you develop those pictures and you look at them, you're like, wow, this is kind of fun. And then eventually it sort of becomes your identity. I took on the role of Jimmy Olsen. You guys maybe are too young to understand that reference, but that's he was the photographer reporter on Superman, right? Okay. That's who Jimmy Olsen was. Okay. Um, and, uh, um, you know, becomes sort of who you are and and what you do. And, and um, then I started bringing my camera to concerts when I was 16 and 17 and uh, taking pictures of bands that I love, Neil Young and the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan. And, you know, most of the pictures were shitty and out of focus and exposed poorly. Uh, but every once in a while, I'd come back with one or two good photos on a roll of film and develop it in my basement in my dark room in my mother's house. And, uh, and so, um, you know, passion breeds inspiration and inspiration breeds passion. It sort of goes back and forth. So when you start becoming passionate about something and you guys are still young enough to probably remember the 10 things you were passionate about when you were 14 and then change when you were became 15 and change when you became 16. And, you know, then you decided you want to do a podcast when you were 20. And, you know, th so, I mean, I watch it with my son and my daughter, their passions changed on a regular basis as they were developing. And so, you know, I was, we, we had less things to be passionate about than when you guys did, because we didn't have the internet. You know, yeah. we didn't have cell phones. Um, uh, you know, we had to like figure out our way with like five television channels and and you know eight radio stations and a and a record player. And so our inspiration came from books and magazines and 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 the radio, really. You know, and the records we listened to. And so those things were inspiration for me, which translated into a passion for something that I was getting into, photography. And then that fed the inspiration and then you'd find inspiration in other photographs that you looked at by other people and you hope that you go through your whole life with that cycle of passion and inspiration wow well jay you mentioned that like for us being only in our early 20s that you could look back 10 years and your passions you could probably remember what your passions were that it's crazy that you found your passion when you were just a teenager and now at this point in your life you're still pursuing what you love 
essentially 45 years later yeah i'm still doing it still taking pictures and and i still fucking love it still have fun doing it i still like you know nowadays we don't develop photos anymore we get taken out of our camera a little chip and put it into the computer and and, yeah. and turned on that way and light those light bulbs up and you know get our eyes wide open and be like yeah fuck yeah wow yeah you know and and and, and be inspired and feel good about it totally and jay you did the three night shows in the madison square garden for the grateful dead some of your first ti- time photographer for them how did you officially get that role who reached out to you well, back then in 1979, you know, you were just allowed to bring cameras to concerts. You didn't okay. need a mass or anything yeah. like that. So, no, I bought the ticket for probably $8, you know, and went to the concert, brought my camera, and walked in the door and tried to get as close as I could to get, you know, shoot a roll of film or, you know, stand in a place until they kicked me out and, and, and move on. And, you know, that's how you kind of start. I didn't, nobody invited me. Nobody yeah. gave me access. I just brought my camera. You were allowed to do it back then. It was it wasn't all controlled by the man like it is today, man. And, you know, like <laughs> man controls it all, the corporate entity. Uh, uh, so, you know, you could, you could be a little bit more free form and free flowing. And, and Jay, you said you would then do personal shoots for Bob Weir, Mickey, some of the other artists. What year was it when they started giving you tickets to go backstage and really get more personal with them? That was way, 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 way later. I mean, the first time that Bob Weir hired me to do photographs i believe it was in 1990 okay. so i started taking pictures in 1978 so it took a while yeah. uh, but you know like in 1979 i was 17 i shot a concert and it got reviewed in a local newspaper and they published two of those photos and i got paid 15 dollars for both of them seven seven fifty each to do your math and um but you know it was many many years later and, and you know by 1990 i was already shooting for rolling stone magazine i was shooting for relics i was shooting for um all sorts of you know guitar player magazine guitar world magazine musician magazine so i'd been being bam magazine i'd been being published regularly so you know i had a portfolio and bob weir was doing a solo project outside the grateful dead called weir wasserman with a guy named rob wasserman who was a bass player and and I was doing some work with Rob Wasserman on a record he was making called Trios. And uh, when Bob needed a new publicity photos for the, for this Weir Wasserman project, uh, B- uh, Rob Wasserman's manager recommended me to Bob Weir's people who said, okay, sure, we'll hire you. And that was the first time that a member of the Grateful Dead actually hired me and paid me money to photograph them. Uh, so, you know, from that point on, I was sort of, uh, a little bit more on the inner circle i was starting to get passes and didn't have to buy tickets anymore and could you know get be able to shoot shows and get a little bit more access but it, you know it all came in very small increments and 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 you got to work hard nobody nobody handed anything to me nobody said you know nobody plucked me out of the ether and said you're the guy you know like i had to prove myself i had to work my ass off and 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 take you know 900 shitty jobs that people paid me a hundred dollars for before i got you know one great job um and that's how you become a photographer back then at least jay a- after um the grateful dead stopped touring after jerry passed away and did you continue working with bob mickey billy and the rest of and phil and the rest of the guys sure. the 2000s and then yeah I, I, that's actually when i really started doing more work for them was post jerry um, I mean, I obviously did things with the, the band, you know, from 90 until Jerry died in 95, but all of the, like the post Jerry stuff, when they p- did the first tour as the other ones, I did the yeah. band publicity photo when they did the dead in 2003 and 2004, I did the band publicity photos when they did further. I did the band publicity photo when they started doing all the fill and friend stuff. I was doing all the PR photos for that. You know, that was still a time where, where. Um, you know, everybody wasn't getting a PR photo taken with an iPhone. You know, they were actually still hiring professional photographers to create images that um, represented who they were so that when a magazine or an online publication needed a photograph, um, they had that to market that tour, market that show, market that band. Uh, you know, this is even still pre-social media at this point. But yeah, I mean, I did more work for the Grateful Dead directly, you know, post Jerry than I did obviously when they when jerry was still alive yeah I, I mean the first i saw of your work was from the fare thee well concert there are some really great pictures and 
I was wondering, because I first got to the Grateful Dead, like when I was getting into high school and middle school, like 2000, like literally, literally during that tour, 2015, and um, they were in Soldier Field. I didn't go, unfortunately, but I knew all about it because we're not far from Chicago. And your parents wouldn't let you go. They thought you were going to do drugs and have sex. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> And I, I, I wondered. And you said to them, you were like, mom, dad, that's exactly what I want to happen. I'm 50. I need to go see fairly well and do drugs and have sex. I don't know who I'm going to do it with, but I'm going to try. And they didn't, they didn't buy that. No, they didn't buy it. Yeah, I they, get it. I, I was wondering, because that was the first time all the original members got back together. During that time, was there any, was, was Dead & Company even a thought? At that point? Or was it? Well, apparently it was because they actually announced Dead & Co., well, I got hired to do the Dead & Co. publicity photo about three weeks after Fare Thee Well. I don't remember exactly when they announced Dead & Co., but I went up to a rehearsal up at Bob Weir's studio, and I remember asking the manager, Bernie, I said, what are, what are they going to call this band? And he looked at me and goes, we're going to call this band Dead & Company. And I was like, hmm, I like it. That's yeah. cool. And uh, and so, um, you know, John Mayer, I have pictures of John Mayer hanging out at Fare Thee Well, but I didn't know why he was there. I just thought he was like, you know, he had played with Bob. He had played with Phil recently. Um, I just thought that he was like, you know, becoming a deadhead and was interested in the music, which he was, but I had no idea that they had this thing yeah. in their sleeve. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, Fairly Well was Fairly Well, and it was a epic, epic moment in Grateful Dead history. Thanks to Pete Shapiro, the promoter, who brought it to Soldier Field and Santa Clara and hired the, the Rainbow Machine and did all that kind of stuff. But um you know, essentially, um, uh, you know, fare thee well, you know, we all thought that that might be the end, yeah. right? And they put a big period on that era. The core four, as you mentioned, Bob, Phil, Mickey, Billy all played that those shows. Um, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know what was going to happen after uh, fare thee well. Nobody really knew. We thought they were getting back together. We went to five shows. It was epic, legendary experience. And then they announced Dead and Go. Like, who knew, right? Yeah. And uh, and then we just got eight incredible years with this incredible band that was just on yeah. fire, and uh, and and it breathed new life into that into that experience. Um, as you know, if you've seen Dead and Co shows, which I'm assuming you did, you yeah. know this was the Grateful Dead were bigger than they've ever been before with Dead yeah. and Co. And so, you know, it, with uh, leading up to Fairly Well, you know, if you lived in on a coast or Chicago or close to Chicago, you know, you maybe saw a lot of Bob Weir and Rat Dog and Further and Phil and Friends over the years. But there were a lot of people after Jerry died, they moved scattered to the four corners and the Midwest and wherever and, you know, got married and had kids and got careers and were working and maybe saw, uh, you know, an original member of the Grateful Dead, you know, the Mickey, Billy, Bobby, Phil group. You know, one of them once a year, once every two years, you know, twice a year. But in San Francisco with Cherubin Crossroads, we were seeing Phil three times a week playing with incredible musicians. And we were seeing Bobby at Sweetwater and Mickey and Billy were doing all sorts of stuff at festivals. And, you know, so we were seeing a lot of stuff during that period from 1995, you know, until 2015, 20 years. Um, I mean, I saw a lot of Grateful Dead music made by those guys. Um, and a lot of other people did. And then we got to fairly well and we were like, okay, what now? Do they go back to their corners and we get to see some small things again? And Phil plays some theaters and some nightclub shows and at Terrapin Crossroads, which is 300 people and maybe plays the Warfield and the Cap for a few thousand people. And maybe Bobby does, you know, starts a new band or, you know, who, who knew, right? Nobody knew. And now, you know, we just had eight years of this incredible experience. And now we're all looking at that as a period and saying, what's next? Like, right. you know, we're not done. We're not done with this music. We're not uh -huh. done with this songbook as fans, as photographers, as musicians. You know, everybody wants to see this thing continue. We all want to see these songs performed and sung and played by the people that wrote and originally performed these songs. And that would be the drummers, Billy Mickey, Phil and Bob. And why do you, why do you think um, Phil didn't join Dead and Company initially or at all? I, I don't I don't know, but I mean I'm going to assume that he was doing his own thing and he was happy doing his own thing. Yeah. You know, like I mean, different flavor. You know, him and Bob did a great run of Further. I don't even know how many years that was six, seven, eight years yeah. also. Um, and you know, Phil. You know, those guys keep 
coming in and out of each other's orbits over the years. Yeah. Um, you know, Phil was Phil's always searching for the sound, as he says, and hmm. so is Bob, and so is Mickey, and so is Bill. So you know, they were just doing their own thing, and and um, you know, probably happy to be doing it. Yeah, Did but, you, and you. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say, Jay, when you think back to the inception of Dead and Co, and now you look as to where we are now, August of twenty three. Has it exceeded your expectations? Did you expect that from the get-go? I mean, when you look back, what was what's your reaction now? I didn't know what to expect. Um, I knew it would be good because I, you know, the band members, you uh, you put Jeff O'Teal and John Mayer together with the four, you know, the three guys, Bobby, Mickey, Billy, like that's a pretty powerful combination. But none of us really knew what to expect. Um, but did it take long for everybody to be like, you know, and even the naysayers who were like John Mayer, you know, pop musician, a pop star joining members of the Grateful Dead. Like, what is that? I mean, it took a minute, in my opinion, for John Mayer to prove himself and prove that he was epic, legendary, all in learning the music and respecting the music and respecting the fans and respecting the scene and and fit in seamlessly in a matter of moments. Really, really, you know, and, and so nobody knew. Nobody knew. Everybody was, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people were skeptical and a lot of people were like, we're willing to take whatever it is. And then they were like, we're willing to take whatever it is. And wow, this is fucking really amazing. So, you know, we all won. And Jay, yeah. they had over 200 shows. Were there any shows that you missed during the eight years of Dead & Co? Oh, yeah, tons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how many I shot, I mean, or went to. I'm going to say somewhere in eight years, I don't know, maybe I saw 60, 50, 60, 70 at the most, something like that. I don't know. Were you at the first show? I don't know. Where was the first show? I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. I, mean, I, 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 know, you, I know you were at the last show because I saw your pictures. I was just trying to think. I, I don't I don't remember if I, I don't think i was at the first show but i don't know where the first show even was i know i went to some early ones and i think i went to one in worcester early on um evan you're looking it up yeah I'm looking um i don't even know when the first dead and coach show october 31st 2015 in madison square garden that was the oh, first man. one yeah i was there all right <laughs> and uh, how would you say the band has evolved since that first show and then the final tour and the fi last couple of shows I think they evolved like a fucking 10 headed dragon on fire <laughs> and they only got better. And, and, um, and but but looking back you know it was it, it's all been great yeah. have they how they've evolved they all got a little bit older yeah uh, <laughs> a little bit grayer a little bit creakier um but they didn't slow down musically. Oh. All right, let's let's talk about something else. Let's talk. We talk. Let's a lot of a lot of Grateful Dead and Dead and Go. Yeah. Uh, um. Let's talk about my museum exhibit. Yeah. How's let, that? It looks. It's going to be amazing. It's at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. It opens August thirty first. Jay, what are you most excited for for this opening for people to see? So the Contemporary Jewish Museum in downtown San Francisco. Uh, is putting on an exhibit called Retro Blakesburg, The Music Never Stopped. That's a song by the Grateful Dead, The Music yep. Never Stopped, Bob Weir song. And um, and uh, the, the museum exhibit is going to feature 215 prints and seven glass cases of ephemera memorabilia that I've that, are, that relates to my my career. All the photographs in the exhibit are all photographs that I only shot on film. So it starts in 1978 when I was in high school and goes up till 2008. So it's a 30-year arc, 78 to 2008. And um, and uh, it's going to be open for five months. It opens, like you said, August 31st. So we'll call it September 1. It's open all of September, October, November, December, and January 2024. Closes January 28, 2024. And um, it is... It is... Um, uh really super exciting and monumental for me to be doing this exhibit uh it's really the exhibit that i've always wanted to do because it's not only my photographs but it's also the things that sort of surround my career uh in terms of just different moments you know 
uh, when the when the registrar, that's the person who sort of ingests all of your work into the museum and keeps track of everything, right? Keeps track of all the archival material, make sure it's all in acid-free boxes and wears white gloves to touch everything. When And her name is Jessica. When Jessica came over with the um, curator, a woman named Kinjin, um, uh, and I started pulling out these archival boxes, acid-free boxes, and I said, here, this is a tear sheet from uh, my first photographs that were published in a newspaper in 1979 that got, I got paid money for $15. And she's like, how do you still have this? And, and, uh, and, and why is it in an archival box? And I looked at her and I said, Jessica, I've been waiting my whole life to meet you. You know, so I've been saving all of this stuff, boxes and boxes and boxes of, of useless things um, that, that a fraction of them are going to get into the, into the exhibit in glass cases, but they're all going to relate back to different, you know, experiences and, and um, uh, films that I shot and artists that I worked with and creative processes. And so it's a combination of early work that I shot in, in, in the early, in the late seventies and early eighties in high school and college. Um, we dip into a brief little period. Don't let your parents listen to this part where I went to prison for drugs uh, um, that's probably why they didn't want you to go to fairly well and do drugs, um, Ethan, because they were afraid you'd end up like me and in prison. Um, but I got arrested with some LSD when I was 50, when I was 19 years old, not 15, 19 years old, and spent a little bit less than a year in state prison. Um, so there's some some photographs and and ephemera that surrounds that experience, late 70s, early 80s. I moved to the Bay Area in the mid 80s, and I tried to figure out how to become a professional photographer. Um, so I started shooting every live concert that I could possibly get my camera in front of. Um, there were still a lot of shows you could just walk in with a camera. There were a lot of shows where you couldn't anymore. And um, I just started shooting pictures at shows and showing it to magazines. And that led to more work. And then I realized I wanted to do portrait photography as well. Because when you um, looked at a magazine, remember those things that you buy on a newsstand in an airport? They had yeah. pages and you flip through them. Um, you guys maybe have never seen one of those because you're kind of young, but um, uh, you know when you looked when you bought a magazine on the newsstand in the airport, um, uh, there used to be newsstands everywhere in town. There's not anymore. They're only at the airport now and the, and the supermarket. It's the only place you can buy a magazine. And uh, if you looked on the cover, it was typically a portrait of the artist. It wasn't a live photograph. And so I realized a couple of things that if I wanted to make a living and 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 uh, propel my career forward. I needed to learn how to do portraits of people because that's what they were using. If you open the magazine after the cover to the opening spread, it was typically another portrait and you turn the page and it was another smaller portrait and you turn the page and then there's one small live photograph of that artist on stage. Right. And you know, those live photographs back then, this big two inches, four inches, five, and you got 200 bucks for it or something like that. But if you shot a magazine cover, they might give you a thousand dollars or $1,500 um and so i realized from an economic standpoint i needed to learn how to do portraiture but also i was craving um i was craving the creative aspect of being more in control of what i was capturing and what i was shooting right so when you're shooting a band on stage you're essentially trying to capture lightning in a bottle in a in a fraction of a second with your shutter speed and you're at the mercy of the band moving around how, what the lighting is which direction they're facing what microphone stand is in the way um all of those things right whereas if you're doing a portrait of somebody you can actually say lower that guitar neck you know pick the guitar neck up closer to your face turn your head to the right because the light's coming from that direction turn your head to the left because the light's coming from that direction stand up and put your hands in your pocket lift your leg up and put it on that rung of that stool you're sitting on so you become a director and a creative director and a film director and you're directing these artists um, so there's way more creative control. Um, and then you can start playing around with different cameras and lenses and types of film and and now different softwares and processing methods, turning things to black and white from color, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot more creative opportunities for me as a portrait photographer. And so the museum sort of traces that from all this live stuff that I did to portraiture to some uh, different creative outlets that I did with some film and processing that I worked with and different cameras. And then uh, there's a section on Clementina Street. That was a street here in San Francisco where I had my photo studio uh, south of market for many years in San Francisco. And so we have a little Clementina Street section. So that's essentially the exhibit. Like I said, it's 215 prints. It opens August 31st. It's open for five months. 
uh, Retro Blakesburg, the music never stopped. If you come to San Francisco, it's open, I believe, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or the museum days. Um, please come and check out Retro Blakesburg in San Francisco. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And keep your eyes open on the website because we're going to be doing all sorts of programming over those five months. From uh, We have a big event already scheduled on October 21st. It's a Saturday. We've got live music with some special guests. And we've got um uh walking tours and and slideshows and and all sorts of different different events that we'll be doing over the course of um of uh the exhibit over those five months well jay that's amazing muzzle top on uh on your i get your life life work in the museum something jay something i want to get a bit i also want to point yeah. out that my daughter my daughter curated that exhibit um with oh, the wow. with the museum and myself so okay uh, uh, again, it came from the Retro Blakesburg brand that she created during the pandemic with the Instagram page and then the book. And we we did this exhibit at a small Smithsonian affiliate museum in New Jersey and then made it bigger for the Contemporary Jewish Museum. But Ricky's been involved with all of that from, from day one. Okay. Hey, Jay, something you might have just answered it, but I want to get a better understanding of when it does come to getting your, your work in this museum, does your daughter reach out to people at the museum regarding getting the work in there? Is someone at the museum been following your work their entire life and they reached out to you? How does that work exactly with you even getting your stuff in there in the first place? So I had gotten a call from a, uh, a museum in New Jersey called the Morris Museum, and that was about 30, 30 minutes away from New York City. Small regional museum in New Jersey, in the suburbs, uh, but also a Smithsonian affiliate museum, the only Smithsonian affiliate in the state of New Jersey. And um, uh, my best friend from kindergarten mark gershman okay um uh who grew up in new jersey and lives in boulder who i didn't see for 30 years whose first grateful dead concert was also my first grateful dead concert we didn't see we i moved away from that town in 1971 and english town was in 77 so we were kids in 71 we were 10 and we both ended up at english town uh in 77 and uh didn't see each other from 1971 until 2002, 30 years wow. and uh, 31 years. And uh, he came to a book signing that I was having in Boulder at a bookstore for my first book that ever came out uh, called Between the Dark and Light, The Grateful Dead Photography of Jay Blakesburg. And he said, will you sign this for Mark Gershman? I looked at him and he's like, hi, Jay, it's Mark. I'm like, Mark, what the hell? Right? <laughs> so, you know, hadn't seen him since we were 10. Um, and um, And so his mother was a volunteer at the Morris Museum. And uh, and I'm going to put on a nice, you know, old lady Jewish New Jersey accent. And she probably said, you know, my son Mark's best friend from kindergarten is a really good photographer and you should check out his work. And they contacted me. And we and it was it was during the pandemic. And uh and the guy said to me, get back to me in one year. Let's have this conversation in exactly one year. Put it on your calendars. I put it on my calendar a year rolled around and I just ignored it. I'm like, these people aren't doing a museum exhibit of me. Like, what's the even point? And about two weeks after it was on my calendar, he contacted me. And then they started the process to do this exhibit at the Morris Museum. And um, we did it at the Morris and it was very successful. And after it came down at the Morris, um, I started reaching out to some other museums, including the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. And they contacted the Morris Museum and talked to them about the exhibit and how it did and what it was like. And uh, the curator in New Jersey gave it a big thumbs up and, you know, positive, positive re review. And the Contemporary Jewish Museum contacted me. I also had a, fr a family friend whose stepmother is on the board of directors of the Contemporary Jewish Museum, and she put in a good word for me as well. Um, and so uh, they contacted me. And I went down and met them, and they said, "Here, come on, follow us. We're going to take you into the museum, into the gallery where your exhibit's going to be." And I'm like saying to myself, "Gallery where my exhibit?" I thought I was going there to sell them on the idea of doing this exhibit. Wow. I didn't realize that they had already decided they were going to do it, and were giving me the exhibit, and were um, showing me the actual gallery. And, and you guys know who Bill Graham, the concert promoter, was. Yeah. So Bill had a museum, an exhibit at the Contemporary Jewish Museum 10, 12 years ago, and it was in the exact same gallery where my exhibit's going to be. 
Um, and so uh, they gave me this 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 gallery and said, "This is this is your room. You know, it's a it's an it's a open open book. You can do whatever you want with it." And so I said, "I can build walls." They said, "You could build walls." And they showed me some schematics of like the Bill Graham exhibit and the Amy Winehouse exhibit and the Leonard Cohn exhibit. And I and I literally, it's not exact, but my layout is very similar to the Bill Graham exhibit in terms of how we built the walls and the spaces that we created. And um, it's a big space, and there's going to be a lot of stuff in it. And uh, so that's pretty much how that happened. Um, that's the long version. And we're still about twenty days away until it opens. But if you do you go there like frequently to make sure everything is coming along. Well, they, we, yes, uh, I have a big meeting there this Thursday. We're going to do the final layout of the glass cases of ephemera. I've, we've already laid them all out here in my office and they have all that material down there. Uh, but we want to just double check to make sure it all fits and, and they've got the actual boxes built now. You know, we were just laying it out on pieces of paper that where you had cut to this correct size. Um, so we're going to go in on Thursday and we're going to test it all out and make sure that it all fits and i'm bringing the i don't know if you can see on this table back here but i got a bunch more ephemera um uh going on over there i don't know where is it anyway oh it's this way no it's this way over there on that table there's a whole bunch more ephemera and um so i'm going to bring extra ephemera just in case because i think we originally we were going to put the labels and the and the text inside the cases and now they're going to be outside the cases and little tiny boxes attached to the outsides of the cases so we have a little bit of extra room now so i grabbed some other backstage passes and old ticket stubs and concert programs and letters and all sorts of weird shit and so we're going to go build that out on thursday but no i mean every step of the way we've been building it out in 3d computer programs and um we've got everything printed but three prints that we missed two of them well one we missed uh one uh had a a a, a, a defect in it after it was made and we had a remade and they made it the wrong size and now we're making it a third time uh so literally i think tomorrow we're going to pick up like the last three or four prints i believe i'm bringing them down to the museum everything's been shipped from the museum in new jersey to the museum in san francisco we got all the about 120 new prints that we're adding in and um we're gonna they're building the walls right now in the in the in the gallery and um we're gonna start laying it out i believe next week and start hanging it on walls um, takes about two weeks to hang the exhibit. Right. And Jay, c- come January of 24, when the exhibit does close down, what happens to all the work? Where does it go? Well, you know any good Jewish museums in Indiana that want it? Um, <laughs> to a load. Uh, who knows? I, I would like it to go to another um, institution. Yeah. Um, I don't know where that would be. Um you know, not a mental institution, but a you know, a, a, a historic, a, an art institution, a museum. Uh, so once we get this museum up and running, this exhibit up and running, um, and I start talking to the museum here, um, they will also help me reach out to other possible museums and other parts. I mean, I'd like it to go to Denver or something like that, or Chicago or New York City, um, you know, Florida. Uh, really anywhere, um, you know, but we won't start looking into that until about one to two months into the exhibit. We'll start reaching out to other um, venues to see if anybody's interested. Cool. Right I mean, it's it's a universal exhibit, but because I'm a San Francisco photographer, I mean, it worked in New Jersey, but the new version of it, we really tailored a lot of it to San Francisco, but that could easily change as well um you know it's it's universal it's just that happens to be like the concert venues were in san francisco not all of them but you know so there's things like that 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 give it a san francisco flavor yeah um, and um out of these photos they're all taken on real film correct correct and i was looking through some of your photos and i mean a lot of people know you through the grateful dead like myself but i was looking through a lot of your photos um throughout the past week and not only have you done all that, you, you did a lot in the 80s and 90s with like the alternative rock band scene, like Green Day, Chili Pepper, Soundgarden. Will those also be featured throughout? All of them are in there. Yeah, the, yeah. There is a Grateful Dead section of this exhibit that's you know probably I don't know 
20 or 25 prints out of the 215. But yes, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Tom Petty, Chili Peppers, um, Meat Puppets, Butthole Surfers, uh, Tom Waits, uh, PJ Harvey, Bare Naked Ladies, Green Day. Um, you know, the list goes on and on, you know, with the number of different artists that we have in the exhibit. So, um, yes, you know, Isaac Hayes, George Clinton, Tracy Chapman, Cheryl Crow, um, uh, the Doobie Brothers, it, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And Jay, during that experience, during that alternative rock era, what's like in your head, like one memory that really stands out that was such a great time? <laughs> one memory that stands out um well son there was that time where i took those 10 hits of acid and and <laughs> went to see the grateful dead for my 100th grateful dead con are you talking about a photographic uh, moment or I just mean, like a life moment come on i'm 61 yeah, years old I like, mean, i've had all these incredible experiences yes i kind of mean like in terms of both like you were shooting so you were hired by the band and then you know you you got it we had a really I mean, cool Portrait of Jerry Garcia was an incredible experience. Doing a portrait of Bob Weir was an incredible experience. Doing a portrait of Phil Lesh was an incredible experience. Yeah. Doing a portrait of Tom Waits was an incredible experience. You know, photographing Tom Petty on stage is incredible. Um, you know, the list of Isaac Hayes, George Clinton. I mean, the, you know, the list of people that I've been able to work with. You know, photographing Joni Mitchell, doing a portrait of her was an incredible experience. Um, um, it it's, goes on and on. There's a, I, I have a serious, you got a one moment. I have a serious question and I don't know how you're going to respond to this. At this point in time, being around all this loud music, how is your hearing? Fucked, dude. My hearing is fucked. What do you think? <laughs> Although I have been wearing, I have been wearing earplugs pretty consistently for the last 20 or so years, but um, there's a band called Living Color, um, which was like this sort of very heavy uh, band out of new york city in the late 80s and they played this club on hate street called the i-beam in 88 i believe and uh i was right in front of vernon reed's amp he was the guitar player legendary guy vernon reed and um and i actually my ears were ringing for five days after that <laughs> and so uh, i think i can kind of pinpoint it to that show that was the beginning of the demise but you know i have to say that the technology has gotten so much better and and you know the grateful dead sound system the dead and co sound system is so next level incredible uh, made by a company called meyer sound here in the bay area and the dead and co front of house guy derek featherstone is incredible i mean that's a band that you can listen to in front of the stage and not need earplugs and hear it crystal clear because the gear and the technique is so superb that you know there's a lot of sound systems where you have to just push it to t 10 11 12 <laughs> Oh, excuse yeah. me but to get it to project but you're it's it's punishing on your ears and the grateful dead sound system the meyer sound system is so incredible um and there's a lot of artists that use meyer sound system. dave matthews the lumineers um bob dylan um you know the list goes on and i think post malone uses a a, a meyer sound system you know all these incredible artists and it you know in my opinion it's and i i don't know you know i'm just a the hippie with a camera with some ears it sounds great to me yeah. but i'm not sure you know i think it's the best sounding gear out there because if you're listening to something at full volume and you can still talk to the person next to you without screaming right but still hear everything at full volume like that's that's pretty fucking cool amazing um being on tour with dead and company the final tour you were about you were at about almost all of the shows what was like a day in the life no I only shot 17 shows out of like oh. 28 or something like that. Okay. So um, um, what was like a day in the life of like shooting a show? Like did you get, what time did you get there? Like what? Uh, I usually would get there anytime between like kind of one and three. Okay. Um, you know, usually I would try and get there around one, one thirty, um, because I usually wanted to go out to shakedown street and shoot some shakedown stuff and, and shoot some deadheads and, people looking to get tickets and you know people looking for miracles stuff like that it, it was it'd be rare for me to get there at three um the only reason that would happen is there was something that i had to do or a meeting or somewhere i had to had to be at beforehand and and you know like when they played in san francisco um uh we did an exhibit at the hate street art center it's a non-profit art gallery and i curated a grateful dead historic photography exhibit that had 
photographs and posters and it was open all, all during the shows and during the days i was doing like a walking tour at like 1 1 30 no 12 yeah 1 1 30 i think it was at 1 p.m i was doing like a quick like 45 minute walking tour of the exhibit and then i was getting had all my gear with me and then i was basically getting in my car and driving to the venue and getting to the venue by about 2 30 it was about a 15 minute drive you know 2 15 yeah. 2 30 so in san francisco is a little bit on the later side but still plenty of time you know when they play a three night run like that they might only sound check one night you know okay. the first night so there's not a band sound checking so i still had time to go to shakedown but shakedown street and um um uh shakedown street and um san francisco was like this weird um uh single lane walkway between this pier and the venue and it was jam-packed and if you didn't get there early enough it literally could take you an hour to walk from one end to the other because it was so crowded and with equipment it was just it was hard so i didn't really spend a lot of time on shakedown street i did walk around the outside of the venue a little bit and shoot some deadheads and but I didn't get kind of bottled up in that vortex of of shakedown, which brought you to this warehouse parking garage where there was more shakedown in it. Um, but I did shoot some of that. You know, I tried to shoot that in every city I went to: Boston, you know, New York, um, you know, anywhere there was a shakedown, I was typically trying to find it and go and take pictures there. Yeah, and I, I mean, we went to a couple of shows. We were at the Wrigley Field shows. We were in Boulder for that. Uh, United. I was I was in Wrigley. I was in Boulder. And I, I, I well, we remember seeing you moving around up front, side stage, before, during the show. And um, what was your what's your relationship with the band? I saw you kind of like chatting with some of the guys side stage. Like, would you consider like John and Bobby and them friends? Yeah, of course they're friends. But you know, I'm there to do a job, right? Yeah. And so. Yeah. You also, you know, I probably annoy the shit out of them because they're like the most photographed people in the world. Yeah, you know, Bob yeah. Weiro said that to me. He goes, I'm probably the most photographed person in the world. And I'm like, you're right. You know, and <laughs> and, and I just look at it like, Bob, as long as you're still playing Sugar Mag, I'm going to still take pictures <laughs> of you. You know, yeah. like you're going to play that song again. I'm going to take a picture of you again. Oh, really? um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've known Jay Lane for 30 years. You know, Jay and I yeah. knew each other long before he was even in the dead world, even before Rat Dog. I've known Jeff Comenti for 20, 25 years. Um, you know, I've known O'Teal for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I've known, um, you know, I, I've met John Mayer almost 20 years ago, but, you know, we had, you know, we were, we had a mutual friend. And so, um, uh, you know, he knew, he remembered who I was from the few interactions we had before he sort of joined Dead & Co., um you know mickey mickey i love mickey mickey loves mickey is the one band member who really truly loves the fact that his career has been documented by a lot of photographers yeah. he loves that visual documentation and i do too you know and 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 billy's just like yeah whatever like some people just don't care bob's like yeah yeah that's a great picture of me from 40 years ago who cares i know what i looked like 40 years ago uh -huh. There's a lot of artists that are like that, but all the fans want to see these photos, oh, right? So we got to be in their face and we got to get these pictures and they got to be good and they got to be intriguing. So, but yes, I'd like to think that all of those guys are my friends yeah. and, uh, and, and appreciate the hard work that I'm putting into documenting their careers. Um, but you know, it's, it's still, it's still work. It is still work. Yeah. And I think it's speak for all the deadheads. Like we love your work. And I mean, for those who aren't at the shows, you just give us a glimpse of how amazing it was every night because i mean it was that's it, that's how it, it was and it was and um i mean beyond besides the grateful dead music are there any other is there is there any other band or artists that you photographed maybe not as much as them but close second yes yes so you know there's a lot of photographers out there that they might shoot an artist like say like the flaming lips okay. right and they'd be like, I don't need to shoot. Th they shot them three months ago, six months ago. They're like, oh, the Flamey Lips, I'm good. They're playing a festival or, or they're coming back again to my town. I just shot them six months ago. I don't need to shoot them again. That was never my thought process. I always wanted to shoot the same bands over and over again and build this body of work because until you have 30 years in the rearview mirror, you don't realize the micro changes that are going on with an artist that you might shoot once, twice, three times in a year as opposed to every, say, three years, right? So some of the bands that I have these, you know, pretty deep archives of are Primus and Les Claypool. Starting photographing um, Les in uh, 89, I believe, was the first song okay. I photographed him. 
So we're 33 years into photographing Les Claypool and Primus, right? Michael Franti, 1987, Spearhead. They're working with Michael for 35 years, 36 years, right? Michael and I, Michael wrote the introduction to my newest book, Retro Blakesburg. The Flaming Lips, first photographed them in 89. So I'm 34 years into that band, right? Going to see them yeah. to play here in San Francisco, not this weekend, next weekend. Uh, Wayne, the lead singer of the Flaming Lips, he wrote the introduction. Uh, he wrote the forward for my book. Michael Franti wrote the introduction for my new book. Um, uh, you know, then there's bands that are a little bit more regional. Um, they tour nationally, but maybe not as big, like a band like the Mother Hips. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Mother Hips, but they're a Bay Area band. And I shot their first record for them. And not their, it was, I think, their second record, but their first major label record. I think I shot that in 94. So we're 29 years into that band. They're still around. They still tour. They still play everywhere in the country. Um, they still put out records. Um, uh, Neil Young, Carlos Santana, both artists that I've been working for regularly and working with regularly. Carlos a little bit more sporadically over the last five or eight or 10 years. But I first worked for Carlos. They hired me in 89 to shoot something, some rehearsals. And all through the 90s, I did a ton of stuff. I shot the back cover of Supernatural, the 50 million wow. selling, you know, biggest record of his career. Yeah. And then all the publicity portraits for that record and did a bunch of magazine covers. And I mean, I shot Carlos a bunch in the, in the 90s, a lot, you know, and then since then a bunch as well, but, you know, trickling off. But you know, I've got a huge Santana archive. I've got a huge Neil Young archive. Um, uh, so there's a lot of artists that I've been fortunate enough to get to photograph over and over. And the benefit for these artists is, is that they can, you know, sort of one-stop shopping, right? Like, oh, yeah. we need a photo from 97. Jay, you shot that tour, right? Yeah, I got that tour. You know, here, well, we're going to release a live record or a live something on Nugs or whatever it might be. You know, do you have a photo from the 97 tour? Do you have a photo from the 2002 tour? Do you have a photo from the 2008 tour? Like, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, but when I first started out, nobody knew that I'd be still standing, that I'd <laughs> still be that guy that actually kept track of all this stuff and okay. and can go back and 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 pull out, um, you know, a photo. Like today, I pulled out some photographs I took of Tracy Chapman 21 years ago. I ran into her guitar player from that a record she was making, a guy named Joe Gore, old friend of mine hadn't seen joe i haven't seen joe in over a decade maybe longer he used to play with pj harvey played with tracy chapman and uh ran into him in whole foods and told him about my museum exhibit and oddly enough he's in my museum exhibit because he's in a photo with pj harvey that i took at shoreline 20 years ago you know and so i was like you know i gotta like and he's good friends with tracy chapman still and i'm like i gotta dig up some of those photos from that tracy chapman shoot he goes oh i'd love to see them and i dug them up and send them out you know to my guy downstairs to get them scanned because i want to share them with you know joe um and so but you know you know literally was able to pull those negatives out of their you know where they're where they're kept in a matter of moments and edit it and get them in in the pipeline to get them scanned too cool so jay how many photos do you think you have in that house millions <laughs> i've shot over two million digital photos already and I probably shot somewhere between 500,000 and a million photos on film. Wow. Uh, we have a lot. Yeah. A lot of photos. Have you ever uh, photographed any of the Beatles? Well, uh, yeah, but not as the Beatles. I mean, I've photographed yeah. Paul McCartney a couple of times on stage oh. and, at a, and uh, off stage, sort of. And I photographed Ringo Starr, but never George or John. John, of course, was murdered yeah. in 1980. I was a huge Beatles fan, but I hadn't really you know i hadn't gotten into his orbit in any way he really wasn't performing then he had just made a record called double fantasy which you know was just coming out when he was murdered and and uh you know so it's possible he could have toured on that record and maybe i would have been able to go to a show and sneak a camera in or bring a camera in and take a picture of him playing on stage but that never happened but yeah paul and paul and ringo there's a great photo that you took i saw the other day i was i was googling just like I was Googling your name and then like certain bands that I like. And I put the Rolling Stones and there's a great picture of Keith Richards and John Lee Hooker. Uh-huh. Yeah. What? When was that? I couldn't find any. Uh, 91, I believe. So it's 32 years ago. Holy fuck. <laughs> uh, uh, John Lee Hooker was recording a record up at a studio here in San Francisco called Russian Hill Recorders. And um, Keith flew in to cut a track with him on that record and the record company hired me and i went over to the studio and did that portrait of the one you're talking of is 
Keith smoking a, a, a cigarette and and uh, doing a French inhale. So the smoke's coming out of his mouth and up his nose, and he's just like looking like a fucking rock star. Yeah. Did you photograph with the stones um, besides that one time? Oh, yeah. No, I photographed them on stage, I don't know, half a dozen, eight, ten times, something like that. Um, just concerts. Um, I've done a portrait of Keith, nobody else in the stones. Um, sort of a candid portrait once of Mick, but not really. And another photo photo that comes to mind, someone who reminds me of John Lee Hooker a lot, there was a great B.B. King photo. He was on stage with um, Muddy Waters and I can't remember the other two people. Johnny Winter and James Cotton. Yeah, that would be a cool photo. I um, I uh, took that at Radio City Music Hall in June of 1979. Uh-huh. I just graduated from high school two weeks before that, so I was still 17. And uh, yeah, Johnny Winter, James Cotton, B.B. King, and Muddy Waters, iconic, epic photograph. Uh, eight, ten years ago, Johnny Winter put out a box set, and they used that photo in the box set. I mean, here's a photo I took when I was 17, and it ended up in a Johnny Winter official box set, you know, decades later. That's amazing. Jay, we really cannot thank you enough for just all your information, the history you have captured. It's truly special. All right, I'm going to give you some info here. Um, you want to check out my books or, or my store with prints and things like that? Rockoutbooks.com. www.rockoutbooks.com. I think you can also go to just blakesburg.com, B-L-A-K-E-S-B-E-R-G.com. And that website at the moment just takes you to Rock Out Books because we're rebuilding the Blakesburg.com website, which I hope will be up before the end of the month, before the museum exhibit opens. Uh, Retro Blakesburg, The Music Never Stopped, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, August 31st, 2023 to January 28th, 2024. Uh, please come and see it. If you come to San Francisco, tell your friends. Um, and uh, on Instagram, I'm at Jay Blakesburg. And on Facebook, I'm at Jay Blakesburg Photography. Uh, check out my stuff. And if you like it, you know, hit a like and, you know, check it out. And if you really love it and you're looking for that next Hanukkah gift for your parents, just get my Jerry Garcia book for them or Retro Blakesburg. If you had a, if you had one piece of advice for uh, all of our listeners, those who are, who are who are passionate like you were at a young age, something you would say to your younger self, what would it be for all those people out there? Just work, work, work. And don't don't smoke that weed. Just work, 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 <laughs> and and develop your skills and develop your passion, and then find and create your career, and then go from there. Right, I, right. work when you're young. Work when you're your guy's age. Bust your ass. Yeah. Well, wise words here from Jay Blakesburg, capturer of moments in time. Jay, thank you for coming on the podcast. All right, thanks, brothers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.